On September 11, 2006, thousands from all over the world gathered in New York City, New York. They wore black shirts, reading Investigate 9-11, and held banners that read, Ask Questions, Demand Answers. This day marked the fifth anniversary of the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. Although the 9-11 Commission report had been published over two years prior, many Americans and citizens worldwide remained convinced that the truth was being withheld from the public. Why? Why was a growing percentage of the world population becoming increasingly skeptical of the events of September 11th? Was it a natural inclination towards believing the worst about the United States government? Or was it a legitimate concern that only grew more powerful with time? The 9-11 Truth Movement includes academics, engineers, physicists, firefighters, intelligence officials, and some of the very people whose lives have been shattered since September 11th. Were they all delirious? You should not be here. No, you've got it all no, We're not. honoring the fallen heroes from 9-11. That's our way. You, no, you're not. No, you are not. Yeah, I feel so uncomfortable I'm sorry. that really next sorry. year, I'm not coming here. Or were they a concerned group of individuals taking the necessary steps to prevent the United States from slipping into its darkest era yet? Was September 11th a surprise attack on America by 19 Islamic terrorists? Or something else entirely? George Bush has spent an uncomfortable day with his people trying to explain away why he failed to pass on warnings the White House had received before September the 11th that terrorists were planning to hijack American aircraft. What happened that day has cast a shadow over just about every area of American life. Now one of the country's best known journalists has said that the American response to the so-called war on terrorism has created a climate of effective censorship in a land claiming to be the home of free speech. There's never been an American war, small or large, in which access has been so limited as this one. The belief runs so strong in both the political and military leadership that those who control the images will control public opinion. Does it suggest that there was somebody uh, on the inside? He, he kind of kind of compared it to the Godfather story, you know, where the where the gun was placed in the in the men's room. There is also a possibility this could be some kind of inside job. May it have been uh, an inside job? Might these people have gotten help from the inside? I was speculating about that along with others early this morning, but now there's a lot more evidence that suggests it's almost certainly the case. It's an obscene comparison, much like it. You know, there was a time in South Africa where people would put flaming tires around people's necks if they dissented. The fear is that you will be necklaced here. You have a flaming tire of lack of patriotism put around your neck. Now, it's that fear that keeps journalists from asking the toughest of the tough questions and to continue to bore in on the tough questions so often. People ought to stay out of our business. A country that hides something is a country that is uh, afraid of getting caught. And in particular, this Bush administration, uh, who is as tight with Saudi Arabia as you can get. The president's father used to stay with the bin Laden family when he would go to Saudi Arabia. In the past, though, the FBI has sometimes made problems worse by ignoring or denying them. FBI management intentionally and repeatedly thwarted and obstructed my attempts to launch a more comprehensive investigation to identify and to neutralize terrorists. To the families and victims 
of September 11th. On behalf of uh, John Vincent, Barry Carmody, and myself, we're sorry. You know, I want to say quietly, but as forceful as I can, that I hope this doesn't go any further. It's gone too far already. I, I am appalled by it. On September 13th, the United States government declares that it has overwhelming evidence that bin Laden is responsible for the attacks. The Taliban offers to hand over Osama bin Laden if the United States can provide evidence. Our position in this regard is that if America have evidence and proof, they should produce it and we are ready for the trial of Osama. Uh, bin Laden in the light of evidence. Are you willing to hand Osama bin Laden to the United States or not? No, no, no. With, without evidence, no. September 23rd, 2001. The, States. the Secretary of State said the administration would soon be able to document its case in public against the Al Qaeda network and Osama bin Laden. And I think it will be persuasive. By the next day, the White House was already backpedaling. But is there any plan to present? public evidence so that you know the average citizen not just americans but people all over the world can understand the case against well i think as secretary powell said you know there there's hope to do that uh, and to do so in a, in a timely fashion over some course of time but i think the american people also understand that there are going to be times when that information cannot immediately be forthcoming and the american people seem to be accepting of that it seems as though you're asking everyone to trust you this information has yet to be provided to the public. Instead of taking credit, bin Laden denies involvement in the attacks three times. December 13th, the Department of Defense releases a videotape allegedly discovered in a house in Jalalabad, Afghanistan. Osama bin Laden describes the attacks along with Khaled al Harbi. American mainstream media and even President Bush would portray this videotape as absolute proof of his guilt. International establishments question the authenticity of the tape. December 26, 2001. A Taliban official claims that he has attended the funeral of Osama bin Laden. The next day, a video believed to be recorded on November 19th is broadcast, in which bin Laden praises the attack, but takes no responsibility. The next bin Laden video would not appear until October 29, 2004 days before the presidential election. The video is described as the clearest claim of responsibility for 9-11. And when questioned why bin Laden's most wanted poster does not indict him for 9-11, the chief of investigative publicity for the FBI, Rex Toom, replied, 9-11 is not mentioned on bin Laden's most wanted poster is because the FBI has no hard evidence connecting Osama bin Laden to 9-11. Clearly, I, I couldn't really believe what I had just heard, so I repeated it, and he said, yes, that is correct. The FBI has no hard evidence connecting Osama bin Laden to 9-11. What evidence do they have? Two bags belonging to Mohammed Atta checked in at Portland Airport but failed to make Flight 11 at Boston, containing a 757 video tour and flight manual, an Arab-English dictionary, a handheld flight computer, a Quran, and his will. Why would Ada take his will onto a plane that would be destroyed in a fiery inferno? Marwan al Shahi's rental car, discovered at Logan Airport, containing an Arabic flight manual, an airport restricted area pass, and documents from Huffman Aviation. Nawaf al Hazmi's rental car, discovered at Dulles Airport, containing Muhammad Ada's instructions a check for a flight school in Phoenix, four drawings of a 757 cockpit, a knife, and maps of Washington and New York. Satam al sakamis passport, discovered below the Twin Towers. Well, Dan, not far from here, a passerby found the passport of one of the hijackers. How does a passport fly out of a man's pocket through a 400-mile-per-hour airplane crash, survive 9,000 gallons of jet fuel, and land intact on a sidewalk a thousand feet below. 
Mahed Maked, and Nawaf al-Hazmi's ID cards discovered in the wreckage at the Pentagon. An ID, Saeed al-Ghamdi's passport, Ahmed al-Nami's driver's license, passport photos, and a business card found in Shanksville. The list goes on. A former high-level intelligence official commented to New Yorker magazine, whatever trail was left was left deliberately for the FBI to chase. They used hundreds of different pay phones and cell phones, often with prepaid calling cards that are extremely difficult to trace. And they made sure that all the money sent to them to fund their attacks was wired in small amounts to avoid detection. Small amounts? Lieutenant General Mahmoud Ahmed, the director of the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence Agency, the ISI, was reported to have wired $100,000 to Muhammad Atta in August 2001. This transfer was facilitated by Saeed Sheikh, the man who allegedly kidnapped and murdered Wall Street Journal reporter Daniel Pearl, who is investigating the ties between the ISI and Islamic militants. And the Pakistanis, of course, if you know your history, have only been a couple of degrees of separation away from the so-called Al-Qaeda hijackers. The ISI has had a long-standing relationship with the Central Intelligence Agency, dating back to the 1980s with the establishment of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, which would evolve into Al-Qaeda. I focus in on the wire transfer that General Mahmoud Ahmed wired to Muhammad Atta right before 9-11. That's pretty crucial because General Mahmoud Ahmed was actually meeting with key Washington, D.C. insiders, Senator Bob Graham, Porter Goss, the future director of CIA, on the morning of 9-11. And he has a relationship not only with the CIA, but with Dick Armitage at State Department, Mark Grossman at State Department. Yes. Are, you, are you aware of the reports at the time that ISI chief was in Washington on September 11 and on September 10? $100,000 was wired from Pakistan to these groups here in this area. And why he was here, was meeting with you or anybody in the administration? Um, I have not seen that report and he was certainly not meeting with me. Yes? In the White House transcript of this exchange, which is delivered to the press, the information about the ISI is censored. Bob Graham and Porter Goss will later co-head a joint inquiry which publicly claims that the Bush administration received absolutely no intelligence that could have prevented the attacks. The meeting begins at 8 a.m. over breakfast at the Capitol building and lasts through Flight 175's impact with the South Tower. During his visit, which began on September 4th, Ahmed would also meet with the present CIA director, George Tenet. A month later, after reports of the transfer between himself and Atta, Mahmoud Ahmed retires from the ISI. The 9-11 Commission report will later conclude that they saw no evidence that any foreign government or foreign government official supplied any funding. The Commission decided not only to omit the information, but to deny it entirely. On 172, page 172 of your report, the 911 report, you state, quote, the U.S. government has not been able to determine the origin of the money used in the 911 attacks. Ultimately, the question is of little practical significance, end quote. How can you state that the question of who bankrolled the deaths of 3,000 American people on September 11th is, quote, of little practical significance? Because it costs so little money. That's the awful thing. About it. it costs less than $500,000. That's why it was so hard to trace. We were able to find pieces of the, of the $500,000, but came in very small pieces. And you said earlier $500,000 to do the 9-11 operation. Well, we know that 100000 was wired to Muhammad Atta directly from the head of Pakistani ISI. Well, I'm not aware of $100,000. Uh, uh, Pakistan, I think, is the most dangerous country in the world. Why was there such a vested interest in covering up the transaction between the ISI and Muhammad Atta? And let's talk about that wire transfer because uh, Governor Kane had no basis for denial because the FBI and the Wall Street Journal confirmed the General Mahmoud Ahmed wire transfer I'm talking about. But the 9-11 Commission deliberately said that funding is not important and assigning blame is not important to them, but it is to us. 
As if their funding was not suspicious enough, a number of hijackers reportedly trained at U.S. military bases. As hard as this is to believe that two of the alleged terrorists involved in what happened on Tuesday may have attended schools run by the U.S. military. Now, this is according to a senior defense official. Ahmed Al-Nami, Ahmed Al-Gandhi, and Saeed Al-Gandhi listed their address on both driver's licenses and car registrations as the Naval Air Station in Pensacola, Florida. Muhammad Adam reportedly graduated from the U.S. International Office School at Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. In response to a Freedom of Information Act, Captain Jason Taylor confirmed that a Muhammad Atta trained there between 1998 and 1999, but did not verify if it was the same person. Abdulaziz Alamari attended Brooks Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. Saeed Algandi and others attended the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California, as confirmed by Lieutenant Colonel Steve Butler, Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. American media ceases investigation when the Air Force says, we are probably not talking about the same people. Two of the hijackers, Nawaf Al-Hazmi and Khalid Al-Madar, rented an apartment from and lived with an FBI informant. Curiously, a number of them were reported to still be alive after the attack. Finally, we were led to believe that the alleged hijackers were fundamentalist Muslims spending their final days preparing for paradise. Yet, in the week before the attacks, a number of them would drink, visit strip clubs, and solicit prostitutes. By all accounts, Ada and his cousin kept to themselves, except for last Thursday at this bar in Hollywood, Florida. It's believed both men came in, drank heavily, and then refused to pay the bill. And the guy got like very, very offended, and he, he said to me, he said, oh, I can pay my bill. I'm, a, I'm an airline pilot. And I was like, okay. Mahed Maked is spotted several times at a porn shop. Hamza Al-Gandhi ordered a porno in his hotel on September 10th. The mayor of Patterson, New Jersey, states that they are spotted more at go-go clubs than at mosques. Regardless of their actions, some of the hijackers' presence was known as early as 2000. What did we know? When did we know it? That's what some congressmen are asking now, or, and asking quite loudly. Did we know the year before 9-11 that one of the hijackers was a terrorist threat? Army Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Schaefer has gone public with his charge that Able Danger, a military intelligence project he worked with in 2000, identified Mohammed Atta, even pulled up his picture along with three other 9-11 hijackers as possible Al-Qaeda members. We found the identities of four of the 9-11 hijackers prior to 9-11. But he says beginning in September 2000, three meetings he set up with the FBI were each canceled by military lawyers. Schaefer also says he remembers telling then 9-11 commission staff at a meeting in Afghanistan about Atta and what the intelligence unit found back in 2000. And he was surprised that it did not show up in the commission's report. I'm told confidently uh, by the person who did move the material over that the 9-11 Commission received two briefcase size containers of documents. I can tell you for a fact that would not be one one-twentieth of the information that, that Able Danger consisted of during the time we spent. A 9-11 Commission spokesman said nothing they got from the Pentagon in early 2004 backed up Schaefer's claim, quote, none of the documents turned over to the Commission mentioned Mohammed Atta or any of the other future hijackers. Where is it? Where's the beef? Where's the substance? Where is this mysterious chart that purportedly says that Otta was connected in some real way to these other hijackers. We'd love to see it. The company responsible for the chart, Orion Scientific Systems, would claim that only two charts were produced and that Otta was not present on either one. Throw them all out, John. These are all the charts. Spread them out. These are all Orion-produced charts. These charts were all done by the data mining efforts. So the Orion Corporation lied to the Senate Judiciary Committee staff all data mining efforts, and yet the company said to the Senate Judiciary staff, we don't have any of those charts, they're not ours. Well, here they are, and their logos are on each one of them. 
Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, at least two of the five people that were going to appear today were threatened with removal of their security clearances if they continue to talk about this. This is going Are you at liberty to identify who those two are? Uh, I will to you. I'd rather do it privately since the Defense Department has chosen not to allow anyone to testify, but I will provide that information to the committee. For the life of me, I don't understand why, uh, as I understand it, I stand corrected if I'm wrong, but I understand the witnesses we assumed we were going to get to hear from, from the Defense Department, have been pulled. They may be or may not be in the room, but have been instructed that they cannot testify. Um, I think that's a big mistake. This is actually a chart of Al-Qaeda and the various cells around the world. Much of this data, most of it, was obtained prior to 9-11 by the work of Able Danger. Uh, as you see, there is an actual photograph what of Muhammad that, What does that depict, generally? It depicts the uh, organizational and activity associations of Al-Qaeda operatives that were involved in 9-11 and related events. And at the time, if the Commission had looked into this in early 2004, the charts that had Muhammad Atta on it still existed. There was a chart in Mr. Smith's office. There was the chart that still should have been in the Defense Intelligence Agency because it wasn't destroyed uh, within Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer's files until the spring of 2004. The same with the chart that Mr. Smith had. Uh, our support to Able Danger became severely restricted and ultimately shut down due to intelligence oversight concerns. I was supported vigorously by both the LIWA and the INSCOM chain of commands uh, and we actively worked to overcome this shutdown for the next several months. In the midst of this shutdown, I along with one of my analysts, Chief, uh, Chief Warrant Officer 3 Terry Stevens were forced to destroy all data, charts, and other analytical products that we had not already passed on to SOCOM related to able danger. Another former DOD official will testify today that he was ordered to destroy up to 2.5 terabytes of data. Now, I don't know what a terabyte of data is, so we contacted the Library of Congress. It's equal to one-fourth of all the entire written collection that the Library of Congress maintains. Uh, are you in a position to uh, evaluate the credibility of uh, Captain Philpott, Colonel Schaefer, uh, Mr. Westfall, Ms. Preissler, Mr. J.D. Smith, as to their uh, credibility when they say they saw Muhammad Atta on a chart? Uh, yes, sir. I believe them uh, ex implicitly. Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, who was the first member of Able Danger to go public, has now been told in writing by the Defense Intelligence Agency that he can't speak to members of Congress or their staff without prior approval. And now a security clearance, which allowed him to deal with classified information, has been pulled. The congressman says Schaefer has been gagged, punished, for speaking up. The official response to Able Danger began in September 2005 with a letter from 9-11 Commissioner Slade Gordon to Senator Arlen Specter. Gordon concludes by saying that since Condoleezza Rice, President Bush, and the White House denied that Able Danger identified the 9-11 hijackers, it never happened. A six-month investigation by the Senate Intelligence Committee concluded in December 2006 that Able Danger did not identify Muhammad Atta or any other 9-11 hijacker. Can we be certain that the hijackers were radical Muslims on a suicide mission? Or is there a possibility that they were trained, funded, and protected in our own country? Rach Deskins? Yes, ma'am, Sergeant Rorta. Yes. I'm just letting you know for information we're having an exercise, SF exercise. We're having a calm out. Okay. Guys, happy, thank you. All right, thank you. Back. Between September 2000 and June 2001, the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, would scramble fighter jets to intercept errant aircraft 67 times. Interceptions are routine and usually occur within 10 minutes of a sign of trouble, such as permanently losing radio contact and transponder signal or flying off course. On the morning of September 11th, according to official accounts, four commercial airliners would be off course and out of communication, and not one of them would be intercepted. How is it that on four separate occasions, on one day, that a trillion dollar military and intelligence infrastructure could fail?
I don't think anybody could have predicted that these people would take an airplane and slam it into the World Trade Center, take another one and slam it into the Pentagon. Nobody in our government, at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings on such a massive scale. But that turns out not to be true. U.S. military planners did envision and practice those very scenarios. As reported by USA Today, the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, conducted exercises with fighter jets, simulating hijacked planes flown into the World Trade Center in the two years before the attacks. Pentagon planners also envisioned the attack on the Pentagon five months before it happened. According to this April 2001 Pentagon email, Air Force officials wanted a war game having a terrorist group hijack a commercial airline and fly it into the Pentagon. The idea was to check response times to launch fighter jets, but according to the Pentagon email, the plan was ultimately rejected by senior Pentagon officials as too unrealistic. Still to come are questions, big questions, about NORAD's response on the day of the attack. Why, despite all the exercises and the planning, Peter, jet fighters were not in place anywhere near New York or Washington. It's quite an amazing story. Many thanks, Brian. Brian Ross. One drill, called Amalgam Virgo, was conducted on June 1st and 2nd, 2001, and simulated successful terrorist attacks. Its purpose was to focus on unconventional threats including an airborne hijacking. One plan would simulate the hijacking of a commercial airliner, which would be crashed into the capital. The second part of the exercise, which was planned but not executed before 9-11, involved two planes with actual pilots on the flight deck. FBI agents would hijack the planes and divert them to secure locations. And on its cover? Osama bin Laden. In fact, Multiple war games were underway on 9-11 itself. The question was, we had four war games going on on September 11th, and the question that I tried to pose before the uh, secretary had to go to lunch was um, whether or not the activities of the four war games going on on September 11th actually impaired our ability to, to respond to the attacks. The answer to the question is no, did not impair our response. In fact, uh, General Eberhardt, who was in the commander of North American Aerospace Defense Command, as he testified in front of the 9-11 Commission, I believe, I believe he told them that it enhanced our ability to respond. There were two CPXs. There was one Department of Justice exercise that didn't have anything to do with the, the other three. And there was an actual operation ongoing because there was some Russian bomber activity up near Alaska. So. Did the war games ultimately help or hinder our response? September 11th was day two of Vigilant Guardian, an exercise staged by the Joint Chiefs and NORAD, which simulated hijacked planes in the northeastern United States. Vigilant Guardian is a branch of Global Guardian, a mass Armageddon exercise being conducted at Offutt Air Force Base in cooperation with NORAD. Originally scheduled to take place in late October, Global Guardian was moved to September. The exercise is reportedly canceled after the second Twin Tower is hit. Three E-4B Doomsday planes remain airborne. Two government sources familiar with the incident tell CNN it was a military aircraft and say the details are classified. This comparison of the CNN video and an official Air Force photo suggests the mystery plane is among the military's most sensitive aircraft, an Air Force E-4B. The E-4B is a state-of-the-art flying command post, built and equipped for one reason, to keep the government running no matter what, even in the event of a nuclear war. Ask the Pentagon and it insists this is not a military aircraft, and there is no mention of it in the official report of the 9-11 Commission. The Pentagon, the Secret Service, and the FAA all say they, at least for public consumption, have no explanation of the giant plane over the President's house, just as the smoke began to rise across the river at the Pentagon. Barksdale Air Force Base also participated in Global Guardian. Instead of returning directly to Washington, D.C., President Bush would fly to both Barksdale and off at Air Force Base before returning to the White House. Another drill, Northern Vigilance, moved fighter jets to Canada and Alaska to monitor a fleet of Russian MiGs on a training mission. 
Northern Vigilance also placed inputs onto military radar screens. Also referred to as phantoms, inputs are simulated errant aircraft, which appear real to those participating in the exercise. We fought many phantoms that day. Three F-16s from Andrews Air Force Base, located 15 miles from the Pentagon, are flown 180 nautical miles away for a training mission in North Carolina. Fort Belvoir, an army base 10 miles south of the Pentagon, intended to test security in case of a terrorist attack. Employees in the Office of Emergency Management on the 23rd floor of World Trade Center Building 7 continue preparations for Tripod, a biological attack drill scheduled for September 12th. Finally, the National Reconnaissance Office in Virginia begins a drill at 845 conducted by a team from the CIA in which a plane crashes into their building. Also, a number of war games were being conducted that have yet to be fully disclosed. Commissioner Gorelick. Um, could, could you please be quiet? We have only a few minutes with General Myers. I'd like to ask a question. General Myers, the... I'm, I'm sorry. I, I would ask, please, people in the audience to be quiet if you want to stay here. Submitted some. So, sir, I... This commission has not answered my questions. I'm walking out. It's uh, a farce. Please walk out. I will. Thank you. So let me get this straight. On the morning of 9-11, the United States is running drills in which hijacked aircraft go in and out of radar. Fighter jets are flown out of the United States and planes are crashed into buildings. What a coincidence. And in terms of what motivated me to bring all the aircraft down, as you see one thing happen, that's an accident. When you see two of the same thing occur, it's a pattern. But when you see three of the same thing occur, it's a program. And so at that point, I decided to bring all the aircraft down. And so, at 9.45, all airborne planes were forced to land. This order applied to all civilian aircraft. Certain military planes were allowed to remain airborne. By 12.16 that afternoon, the FAA managed to ground over 4,000 planes without incident. Uh, during the time that the airplane coming in to the Pentagon uh, there was a young man who would come in and say to the vice president, the, the plane is 50 miles out, the plane is 30 miles out. And when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, uh, the young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary? Arlington, Virginia. American Airlines Flight 77 allegedly crashes into the ground floor of the Pentagon. Pentagon authorities will deny that the building had anti-aircraft defense. The FBI arrives within minutes and the site is declared a federal crime scene becoming their exclusive responsibility. With the help of civilians, they comb the Pentagon lawn for debris and within 24 hours they had confiscated every known video of the attack. Pentagon officials initially denied that any of their cameras captured the event. However, on March 7, 2002, five images taken by a security camera from across the heliport are released. For years, these five frames were the only public footage of the Pentagon attack. This would change on October 14, 2004, when Scott Bingham would file a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit requesting videotapes that captured the impact of Flight 77. Special Agent Jacqueline McGuire of the FBI located a CD-ROM that contains copies of two time-lapse recordings made by security cameras. 
released on March 16, 2006. A video, taken from a Sitco gas station, which is open only to Pentagon employees, released on September 15, 2006. And the Doubletree Hotel in Arlington, Virginia, released on December 7, 2006. Agent McGuire concluded that the FBI possessed 85 videotapes that might be potentially responsive. As of this date, we have no clear images of what happened at the Pentagon on the morning of 9-11. The official story goes as such. American Airlines Flight 77 was taken over by five hijackers, led by Hani Hanjour. Hanjour entered the United States in 1996 to become a professional airline pilot. He would not complete a single course. It was kind of a waste of time. He wouldn't show up for uh, flights on time, didn't do his homework. Average or below average piloting skills. Mm -hmm. English was very poor. Uneventful from our perspective. Yeah. The 9-11 Commission concludes that Han Yor was perhaps the most experienced and highly trained pilot. Flight 93's hijacker, Saeed Al Gandhi was a former Saudi fighter pilot. How could Hanyor be more experienced than him? On the morning of 9-11, Hani Hanyor and his four accomplices traveled to Dulles International Airport outside of Washington, D.C. They had spent the weeks beforehand at the Valencia Motel in Laurel, Maryland, six miles from the National Security Agency. All five will set off metal detectors and be subjected to additional screening, yet all of them proceed to board American Airlines Flight 77, which is described by the Washington Post as unusually light on passengers. Out of 188 seats, 64 would be filled. In fact, all four planes involved in 9-11 would be at approximately 30% capacity. The hijackers will board alongside Barbara Olson, the wife of Solicitor General Ted Olson, and a number of employees from Boeing, Raytheon, the Department of Defense, Lockheed Martin, American Airlines, the Navy, Army, and other government agencies. The pilots were Officer David Charlebois and Captain Charles Burlingame. Charles Frank Burlingame III, an aeronautical engineer and a graduate of both the Naval Academy and Top Gun Fighter Pilot School, flew F-4 fighter jets and developed anti-terrorism strategies at the Pentagon before retiring in 1989 to take a job at American Airlines. He would remain active in the reserves and anti-terrorism exercises until 1996. His Boeing 757 would be crashed into the very section of the Pentagon he used to work in. The hijackers would have only moments to subdue both Charlebois and Burlingame, remove them from the cockpit, and retain control of the airplane. Yet, the plane is hijacked without incident at 8.51 and makes an unauthorized turn to the south three minutes later. No mayday, no hijack code, no sign of struggle. Flight 77 will fly all the way back from the Kentucky-Ohio border coasting for another 43 minutes against its flight path before crashing into the Pentagon without any military interception. Had Hani Hanjour wanted to inflict maximum damage, all he had to do was continue his trajectory and nose down into the roof of the Pentagon. Instead, he begins a complicated 330 degree turn dropping 7,000 feet and exposing himself for an additional three minutes while executing a maneuver described by experienced pilots as nearly impossible, requiring professional expertise. 
In essence, an amateur pilot considered a waste of resources by instructors who was unable to control a small Cessna in August 2001 executed this nearly impossible maneuver in a 757 with skilled precision a month later. Todd Lewis is working radar at Dulles Airport. One of my colleagues saw a target moving from the northwest to the southeast. And it was just a countdown, 10 miles west. And uh, she notified the supervisor. Nine miles west. But nobody knew that was a commercial flight at the time. Nobody knew that was American 77. What, what did you think? It was a military flight of some kind? I thought it was a military flight. I thought that uh, Langley had scrambled some fighters. and It was almost a sense of relief. This must be a fighter. Maybe one of them got up there. It was really moving fast. It was eh? moving very fast, like, like a military aircraft might move at a low altitude. This must be one of our guys sent in, scrambled to patrol our capital. The 757 will descend over Columbia Pike, flying adjacent to the Sheridan Hotel, Virginia Department of Transportation, Navy Annex, and fly past the Sitco gas station before crossing Washington Boulevard. Five light poles are knocked out of the ground. One reportedly strikes the Washington, D.C. taxi, driven by Lloyd England. Flight 77 manages to hit the only section that was reinforced to withstand a terrorist attack reinforced steel and blast-resistant Kevlar windows an inch and a half thick. The renovation, planning for which had begun in 1991, was only days away from completion. Had the plane struck anywhere else, the casualties and damage would have been far greater. An area that normally would have housed up to 5,000 occupants yielded 125 casualties. The Pentagon's outer wall had a hole approximately 20 feet in diameter on the first and second floor, and visible damage 90 feet across the first floor. I would say if it was 16 feet diameter, 20 feet tops, that's what would start me so curious, as I was trying to find something, there was no marks on the, on the, on the grass. It, something never hit the ground. It didn't hit the heliport. I mean, it was a precision or awfully lucky hit. I mean, I, I don't know how it didn't bounce. I, I don't know how it hit directly in the side of the building without touching the ground, going as fast as it obviously was going. Um, but I can't believe the thing is, is more than a garage door. And again, the classic airplane crash has wreckage. I mean, they found the axles from the rider truck in Oklahoma City. I can't believe they can't find an engine. Opinions differ at this point. People that believe a 757 hit the Pentagon and people that don't. Those that believe a 757 did hit are fueled by the damage path, wreckage outside the building, Eyewitness testimony. While we were in the uh, sitting in the office, and all of a sudden we heard some rumbling. Something is kind of hitting us. Very imminent things could happen. So uh, we look at each other, and it really uh, the noise is un unbearable. And at the last moment, my brother uh, jumped out the uh, office. We I heard about the uh, very weak jet sound. Looks like a just up to here. I just look at the outside, big black wings coming that way. And then I just running out, and then, you know, two, three seconds, boom. We're used to seeing planes. Maybe a 20 passenger corporate jet, no markings on the side. I saw a plane going down, big plane, commercial liner type. And I saw this jet coming in, and it was really low. And, and uh, it was an American Airlines jet. You could read the AA on the side, silver fuselage. This particular plane was awful low. And as we were coming down on a 395, it came across in front of us, and it was low. Coming in at a shallow angle, like it was landing right into the side of the Pentagon. It just, just happened. It was really amazing. 
huge explosion. So you actually saw the plane impact the side of the building? Yes, I did. Just one plane? Just one plane. I basically made a turn too early and ended up right in front of the Pentagon on Route 27, which goes just, I didn't even know it was the Pentagon. I mean, I've grown up, I've grown up uh, in this area, um, but I just am basically never over there. Besides, you can't really tell it's five-sided anyway, so I never, I didn't even know it was the Pentagon, so, but I was just in traffic. My main focus was that I was late for the service and we were stuck in totally standstill traffic, just sitting dead still on the highway. And basically, without warning, there was just the sensation of something coming over the top of us. It seems the plane was so low that it hit a light pole uh, that was um, just um, on the edge of the highway, on the, on the far side there, um, before it came over the highway, it clipped this pole, which I heard ended up being knocked over and hitting a taxi, which was near, near my car. Okay, my name is Lloyd England. 9-11, I was driving my car on my way home. This airplane flew over top of my car. It was real close. Something glass and lava, a loud noise happened, and the pole came through the dashboard right through the car. I, I stopped the car in the, in the middle of the street. It didn't stop straight, it st stopped at an angle. As, as far as the plane went through, it didn't come back in until I stopped the car and got out. Then I looked for the plane. There was no plane, but it was quiet. If had nobody seemed to have indicated where, where something happened, I wouldn't have known. And I was there. I mean, I'm there. And, and, and the, the plane, the, the wing spread would have been from, from that house, maybe halfway in my house. And the big wing, the big motors underneath of them. And nothing was left out. Those that think a 757 did not hit are fueled by the damage to the building and lack of large structural debris outside, particularly the lack of damage from the wings and vertical stabilizer and the fact that those objects, as well as the engines, were never fully recovered. Is there anything left of the aircraft at all? The, first of all, the question about the aircraft, there are some small pieces of aircraft visible from the interior uh, during this firefighting operation that I'm talking about. Um, but not large sections. In other words, there's no fuselage sections and that sort of thing. They said it was a plane and I didn't see any pieces of any plane and I couldn't believe that a plane hit the building. There are numerous parts to a 757 that are virtually indestructible. To date, we have not seen a single piece positively identified as Flight 77s. The fact that an exit hole inside the Pentagon is not explained by any official report on the attack. The fact that there was no impact damage on the lawn. And the fact that out of the videos that have been released, none of them clearly show a 757. The outer wall will collapse 20 minutes later, leaving a hole approximately 70 feet wide. What hit the building may be important. However, our focus should be on why it was hit in the first place. The section hit was the headquarters of Naval Operations, Naval Intelligence, and the Navy Command Center. Army personnel were also killed. A number of accountants and budget analysts were also present at the time and killed in the attack. The Arlington County After Action Report states that important budget information was in the damaged area. It's interesting that 24 hours prior, Donald Rumsfeld publicly made this announcement. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. According to the 9-11 Commission report, the military was unprepared for the transformation of commercial aircraft into weapons of mass destruction. Counterterrorism forecaster Marvin Citron authored a report in 1994 for the Department of Defense, warning of Washington's vulnerability to terrorist attack. We predicted a plane could have crashed into the Pentagon. That's about as specific as you can be. If you made a right turn at the Washington Monument, you'd hit the Pentagon. A left turn, you could hit the White House. Back on October 24, 2000, the Pentagon conducted MASCAL, a mass casualty exercise which simulated the impact of a Boeing 757 into the building. 
I'm very curious, and, and as time goes by, uh, it makes you more curious as you have time to dwell on the details and all the information that's becoming available. I can't drive my car that, that, that well, but I can't imagine somebody just climbing behind the wheel of an airplane and doing what they did and doing it so well. Basically, it was the strangest day I've ever spent in my entire life. Uh, it was like in slow motion. I get chills every time I hear the audio. I get, I, I physically, I swear, I get chills every time I watch the video. I can feel the heat. I can smell the fuel, or I can smell the burning. There's been a lot of curiosity, I think, in in, in time, and even for me, who was there. Um, I still have questions of, did I really see what I think I saw? You know, when you're led to believe and you think you believe what you think you saw, I think that uh, you begin to buy into it. But the more you dwell on it and the more the evidence comes forward, the questions get larger and larger and larger. I I'd like some conclusion. I mean, uh, I'm sure the families would, and I'm sure the military knows a lot more than we do in the government. But I'm, I'm just astounded that they don't share more of the information that's available. If the government was 100% forthcoming, and wanted to squelch any doubt as to what happened. Why have they controlled the evidence so strongly? Why is there no positive identification of Flight 77? Why, when Vice President Dick Cheney was aware of an incoming aircraft up to 50 miles away, were employees allowed to remain in the building? Had a single alarm gone off inside the Pentagon, 125 people would be alive today, and hundreds more would not be suffering and when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, the young man also said to the vice president, do the orders still stand? And uh, the vice president turned and whipped his neck around and said, of course the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary? Norman Mineta's testimony would be completely unreported by the 9-11 Commission. It would also be censored from the online archives of commission hearings. A spokesperson from the National Archive claimed that it was a technical snafu. The 9-11 Commission will later conclude that Vice President Dick Cheney did not reach the bunker until 9.58. Uh, my main concern is that in your testimony, you stated that Vice President Dick Cheney came into the, uh, the e POE, POEC uh, office at 9.20 at when you arrived and he was already there. He has gone in front of meet the press and he said that he was there at 9.38. They did that because uh, they'd received a report that an airplane was headed for the White House. This is Flight 77, which had left Dulles. Flight 77. It left Dulles. It's best uh, we can tell, uh, they came initially at the White House. The plane actually circled the White House? Didn't circle it, but was headed on a track into it. Tracking it by radar. And uh, when it entered the, the danger zone, and looked like it was headed for the White House, was when they grabbed me and evacuated me to the basement. The plane obviously didn't hit the White House, turned away and, and we think flew a circle and came back in and then hit the Pentagon. Yeah, the 9-11 Commission report puts in there at 9.58 that morning. 58? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you got a chance to read it, but it puts no. in half an hour later. So I don't mean to ask a rhetorical yeah. question, but to the best of your recollection, was Vice President Dick Cheney already oh, there absolutely. at 9.58? The flight you're referring to is the... The one. flight that came into the Pentagon. Pentagon. This was um, before, flight before, before um, American Airlines went into the Pentagon. Yeah. Yeah. Norman Mineta uh, was in the bunker with Cheney. And so that, the fact that that wasn't in the 9-11 Commission report was rather odd, don't you think? Yeah. Uh, who was that young man? Did anybody ask who that young man was? How could Dick Cheney, or anyone in the administration, especially after an aide warned him a plane was 50 miles out and two planes had already struck the World Trade Center, allowed the Pentagon to be struck. You know, am I prepared to believe that Dick Cheney would be capable of knowing about this kind of attack on the Pentagon, for example, and allowing it to happen? Well, from what I know about Dick Cheney, yeah! Nine fifty nine, New York City, New York. The South Tower of the World Trade Center, one hundred and ten stories tall, collapses to the ground in approximately ten seconds. Twenty nine minutes later, the North Tower follows suit, also collapsing in approximately ten seconds. Later that evening, at five twenty, World Trade Center Building Seven, forty seven stories tall, 
collapses to the ground in under seven seconds. The official explanation is that falling debris from the North Tower created a series of fires inside the building. If this is true, it would be the third steel frame skyscraper in history to completely collapse because of damage and fire. The first two would be the Twin Towers. February 23rd, 1991. One Meridian Plaza, a 38-story skyscraper in Philadelphia, burned for 18 hours across eight floors. It is later described by officials as the most significant fire of the century. It did not collapse. October 17, 2004. A 56 story skyscraper in Caracas, Venezuela, built in 1976, burned for over 17 hours and spread across 26 floors. It did not collapse. February 13, 1975. A three alarm fire broke out between the 9th and 14th floors of the North Tower. No one died. The building was unoccupied. The fire began in an electrical wiring closet on the 11th floor. There should have been fire stops to prevent it from spreading, but there weren't. The fire spread to six other floors. Even without a sprinkling system, fire department officials and building officials here say that there's no chance the World Trade Center could become a type of towering inferno. The fire is so intense, it leads to the installation of sprinkler systems which would come in handy on May 19, 1975, when seven fires strike the complex. The South Tower had garbage fires dispersed between the 25th and 36th floor, and the North Tower had a fire on the 11th floor. Six of the fires were minor, but the seventh on the 32nd floor of the South Tower caused heavy damage. Guess what? They did not collapse. September 11, 2001. Two 110-story skyscrapers, completed in 1973, burned for 56 minutes over eight floors and 103 minutes over five floors, respectively, before collapsing completely to the ground. Some argue that this was due to the construction of the Twin Towers. The Twin Towers were composed of 200,000 tons of steel and 425,000 cubic yards of concrete. The core of each tower was a rectangular pillar, 87 by 133 feet, comprised of 47 steel box columns ranging from 36 by 16 to 52 by 22 inches. The North Tower was completed in 1970, standing at 1,368 feet tall, and the South Tower was completed in 1973, reaching 1,362 feet tall, making them the tallest buildings in the world at the time. They were designed to withstand multiple impacts from a Boeing 707, the largest aircraft at its time. An analysis released in 1964 claims that the buildings were investigated and found to be safe in an assumed collision with a 707 traveling at 600 miles per hour. Such collision would result in only local damage which could not cause collapse or substantial damage to the building. A 707 has four engines instead of two and its cruise speed is 607 miles per hour. The Boeing 767s that struck the North and South Tower were traveling at 440 and 540 miles per hour, respectively. with him we have a witness who saw what happened at the world trade center this apparently was uh, a commuter plane that smashed into it with such force that uh, the windows of the pick a bagel smashed with a big bang uh, everybody was very frightened did you uh, manage to see what kind of plane it was i couldn't tell it, it was a smaller it looked like a smaller plane but i couldn't tell not 
I'm not really sure. A medium-sized body plane with uh, engines on both sides. Almost like a gray black color in nature on the plane. I uh, would say it wasn't a huge jet, but it was a plane that sounded like it was a fighter jet overhead. I worked right next door at 74 Trinity Place. We heard the first one come in. I, I didn't know where it was. It sounded like a missile. Oh, my God, Ed, another plane just hit the World Trade Center. Another plane. It was a medium-sized plane. Unbelievable. It, it, it would appear, Jim, mm. as if there's more smoke coming from the ground at, at some and point. Uh, well, we used to have another uh, we have uh, yes things have fallen to the yes. ground and are burning and we have one gentleman told me he was on the 65th floor standing next to an elevator when the elevator exploded and knocked him out of his shoes another woman said that she was working on the 49th floor and she's seen people in the stairwells with burns broken arms people are passing out of the stairwells from the heat she says there's a lot of heat and smoke it's a horrible scene here i'm live at broadway and fulton allison keys wcbs 880 news all right thank you allison well basically there's people running around down the street all the glass panes that are on the bottom yeah. part of the world trade center are all blown out you, you, you when i first heard it and ran over to the window it looked like there was fire on the bottom floor well they're ahead there and uh, all of this, the world... Oh, uh, wait. Oh, my God. A, oh, my God. The building fell. Are you there? The building just fell. You said it sounded like the 4th of July. You heard a big explosion before I, the building fell? I saw it as it was happening, and it sounded as if you had a hundred of those little black cat firecrackers, and you lit them all off at once. That's what it sounded like. It sounded like the finale of the 4th of July over the East River. Oh we just gosh. witnessed some kind of secondary uh, follow-up explosion. 10 o'clock Eastern Time this morning, just collapsing on itself. We have no idea what caused this. Almost looks like one of those planned implosions. As if a demolition team set off, when you see the old demolitions of these old buildings, it my folded God. down on itself and it is oh not there God. anymore. If you wish to bring uh, anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the, at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. Right now, police have to determine is whether that explosion was caused from the initial impact of the plane or whether it was something that was exploded on the ground. Generally speaking, for a building to collapse in on itself like that, it would seem to indicate that there could have been an explosion, a bomb planted on the ground that would make the building collapse within itself. By that evening, eyewitnesses and experts alike were rushing to defend the official narrative of events, claiming that raging jet fuel fires melted the steel inside the Twin Towers. I saw this plane come out of nowhere and just ream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. When one of those airplanes crashed into one of the towers, it was the equivalent of a, a six-point earthquake. Marlene Davis is the Dean of Architecture at the University of Tennessee. She calls the 110-story tall twin tower tube structures. That means there are no internal columns holding it up. You know, when we saw this yesterday, people said, oh my goodness, there was a bomb on there. There must have been a bomb that must collapsed. Must have been a bomb it. below right. that, that, that finished the job. Well, it turns out we heard from uh, experts who said that, you know what, the, the fire on those floors, probably 1,500 degrees. Steel can only withstand so much because the steel structure that holds the building up was on the outside and essentially the building started to melt and it gave way and it toppled. Engineers suspect the temperatures inside the crash areas could have quickly reached well over 1,000 degrees, perhaps approaching 2,000 degrees, beyond the melting point of any steel. They were not designed perhaps to take a direct strike from something the size of a 737 or an Airbus, perhaps fully loaded with fuel. Steel will melt physics professor and explosives expert Van Romero. E even if there was no secondary explosives in the building, hitting the air, uh, having the airplane hit the building where it did, a large amount of weight above the damaged location, um, that damaged location being further damaged by the fire, uh, that uh, structure could no longer support the weight above it, and the collapse ensues. Numerous individuals, including some of the architects themselves, would claim that plane crashes were never taken into consideration and that the building was doomed to failure. Hyman Brown was the project engineer on the Twin Towers, the man on the ground in charge of making sure the buildings were built right, the way it was designed. Structural steel is fireproof to last between one and two hours, which it did, and then steel melts. Each tower was built around a central core, 
That core kept the building up, supporting the tower's so-called dead weight. Oh my but when God. steel melts, according to Brown, like dominoes, it falls. Brown says oh the towers God. were built to withstand 200-mile-an-hour hurricanes, the 100-year storm, the worst nature could dish out. But he says an airplane crash never oh entered anyone's God. mind. However, that's not entirely true. Yet the impact of the planes alone did not cause that failure. In fact, tall building designers try to anticipate air accidents. Mark Loiseau is president of a company called Controlled Demolition. When this structure was designed, it was designed, uh, to the best of my understanding, to take the impact of what was then the, the state-of-the-art airplane being used in our country, the Boeing 707. The building was designed to have a fully loaded 707 crash into it. That was the largest plane at the time. I believe that the building probably could sustain multiple impacts of jetliners because this structure is like the mosquito netting on your screen door, this intense grid. And the jet plane is just a pencil puncturing that screen netting. John Skilling, the World Trade Center's head structural engineer, told the Seattle Times after the 1993 bombing that if a plane struck the building, there would be a horrendous fire, but the building structure would still be there. On August 21, 2002, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, commenced their investigation. NIST is a government agency that reports back to the United States Department of Commerce, headed at that point by Donald Evans and later replaced by Carlos Gutierrez, both Bush cabinet appointees. As part of their investigation, NIST contracted Underwriters Laboratories to recreate floor models from the Twin Towers for the purpose of fire resistance tests. We heard about it on the news. We heard about it right away that the floors didn't collapse. Okay, so they tested these huge models. They're models, but they're huge. I mean, one model was essentially the same size and exactly the same as one of the, of the types of floor oh, sections okay. used. And they tested it according to ASTM E119. They exposed it to much longer fire and uh, temper higher temperatures than we know were, were present in the World Trade Center. So right away there was a problem. And that's August of 2004. The final report was released on October 26, 2005, producing over 10,000 pages. It will not explain the actual collapse of the buildings. They only claim to get to collapse initiation and state flatly that it led to global collapse. The report, admittedly, does not actually include the structural behavior of the tower after the conditions for initiation were reached and collapse became inevitable. We were charged with finding out the cause of the collapse. And we, we uh, found uh, what happened. I think uh, we've scientifically demonstrated uh, what was required to initiate the collapse. Once the collapse initiated, the video evidence is rather clear. It, it was not stopped by the floors below, so there was no calculation that we did uh, to demonstrate that, so what is clear from the good videos. NIST concludes that they found no evidence suggesting that the World Trade Center towers were brought down by controlled demolition. Where would people get an idea like that? One. Except for material that was blown outwards, the Twin Towers collapsed into their own footprint, symmetrically, at nearly free-fall speeds. Newton's laws of motion determine how long it takes an object to travel a certain distance in complete freefall. In a controlled environment, an object dropped from the roof of either Twin Tower would reach the ground in 9.2 seconds. The 9-11 Commission report will state, at 9.58, the South Tower collapsed in 10 seconds. Even NIST says the tops of the buildings came down essentially in free fall. Judge for yourself.
and our conclusion is that the building should not have fallen that rapidly if indeed fire caused the, the collapse. And so, in fact, there's one uh, mechanical engineer, Gordon Ross, in the Journal of 911 Studies, who's done a thorough in, uh, analysis based on conservation momentum. If the official story was correct, then the heating that was supposed to cause the failure would have been a, a much slower event, and it would have been an asymmetric event. For the tower to collapse straight down onto itself is flies in the face of what we know about steel and how steel behaves. When we have a failure in one area, then the failures tend to, to continue within that area and you see an asymmetric collapse, possibly the, the upper section falling off as it twisting away from the tower and falling off. But it, it's very unusual to see the upper section falling straight through the path of the greatest resistance, which was straight down through the middle of the tower. It just, it does, just does not add up. 2. Molten metal exceeding 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit was discovered in the rubble of Ground Zero underneath the Twin Towers and Building 7. Even with heavy rain on September 14th and 21st, a constant stream of fire retardants and water described as creating a giant lake, these fires would not be extinguished until December 13th, 2001, making it the longest burning structural fire in history. Was the jet fuel responsible? Dr. Frank Gale, who was working with NIST, claimed in 2005, your gut reaction would be that the jet fuel melted the steel. Indeed it did not. The steel did not melt. The temperatures that we know existed within the, the collapse, within the debris pile, are physically impossible from an atmospheric jet fuel fire. Cannot be done. I'm curious about uh, the uh, pool of molten steel that was found in the bottom of the, of the towers. Um, I, I am too. And <laughs> just tell me about it. You, have you seen it? Well, I, not personally, but my witnesses there found huge poles of molten steel beneath the towers. And uh, scientists, some scientists don't think that the uh, collapse of the building could have melt, melted all that steel. Um, first of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten, molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. Uh, I was on the site, I was on the steel yards, so I can't, I don't know that that's so. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, like a molten bit. steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like lava. Like, like, like lava from a volcano. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped down the sides of a wall from Building 6. However, they do hit hot spots occasionally, and everything stops. There were fires of 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit below the ground. I can't, I don't know that that's so. There's uh, video so of it. It around 2,600 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, I think it's probably pretty difficult to get that kind of uh, uh, temperatures in a, um, uh, in a fire. Well, NASA pictures, uh, thermal uh, images showed those, those sorts of temperatures in the basin. Could you send them to me? Okay. My name is Mark and I'm the individual who was questioning Dr. Gross and he asked me to email to him those thermal images. When I approached him after his talk to get his email address for that purpose, he refused to provide it to me. I think this is important because it reveals the attitude of the NIST investigators, which is one of willful ignorance of what really happened on 9-11. As well as the molten metal in the debris, it was also observed prior to the South Tower's collapse. Also, a minute and 20 seconds before collapse, large amounts of white smoke begin pouring from the base of the South Tower. Three, the concrete, and in fact, Virtually everything except the metal inside the Twin Towers was pulverized as the building collapsed. This pulverized material created pyroclastic dust clouds that raced down city streets, coating lower Manhattan in a fine dust. Pyroclastic clouds generally occur during two events, volcanic eruptions and controlled demolitions.
4. Steel beams weighing up to 200,000 pounds were thrown laterally up to 500 feet. A cross-section from the World Trade Center weighing approximately 300 tons was embedded in the southeastern corner of the American Express building. This piece would have had to travel at least 390 feet, maintaining enough kinetic energy to embed itself in the corner of the building. What we should have seen uh, in the debris pile was a, a pyramidal shape. If it had been a, a gravity-driven collapse, we would have seen a, a roughly pyramidal shape or a conic shape. What we actually did see was a massive ejection of, of dust and debris and large sections of steel from well away from the towers, uh, tens of metres uh, away from the towers. That's hard to, to, it's hard to, to see a reason for that within a gravity-driven collapse. Five, firefighters and eyewitnesses reported a series of explosions before and during the collapses. And we heard the noise uh, associated with an implosion. Secondary explosion on Tower 2. Some sort of explosive device. We're obviously having a bit of trouble right now maintaining our location because we just heard one more explosion. There was another major explosion. Do you know anything about those extra no, explosions we heard? No, I do not. Were they car bombs? I have no idea, ma'am. The string shook and I, felt, I heard like an explosion. Do you, do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me, it sounded like it, it, to me it sounded like an explosion. We heard a very loud blast, an explosion. They were taking photographs and securing this area just prior to that huge explosion that we all heard and felt. Not clear now is why this uh, explosion took place. When there was some sort of collapse or explosion, from street level, as though it had exploded up, a giant rolling ball of flame, and the firefighters screamed, run. It was this blast of warm air. It wasn't hot. It was warm. And it picked me up and threw me up against the wall of the building I was. You were picked up off the ground. Physically picked up off the ground. I remember an explosion. At that point, I got knocked out. I don't remember anything. Then I got up, and I looked out the window, because the windows exploded, and the street below caved in. And at that point, there was like fireballs coming up. An hour later than that, we had that big explosion from much, much lower. I don't know what on earth caused that. About 15 minutes after they made their entry, uh, we heard a boom. I don't know if that was the infrastructure that was going or another explosion. Uh, again, there has been a second explosion. John, just seconds ago, there was a huge explosion, and it appears right now the second World Trade Tower has just collapsed. All of a sudden, I heard rumbling, and we all started running away from it. The glass, like, blew out and threw and me onto the sidewalk, and I, I couldn't up. see for, like, 20 seconds. It was like, it was like, holy hell, coming down the stairs. And then when we, when we got, finally got to the bottom, they were coming out on a, a mezzanine level there. And another explosion came right from me because everyone flying. We stuck on the stairs for a while. We finally got down to the lobby. Then we get to the lobby, it was this big explosion. So I was real lucky. I don't know what happened to the people behind me when that blast occurred. And uh, it was actually on the uh, 78th floor of the uh, second tower and was evacuating the tower and uh, experienced all these explosions and made his way back down. We presume because of the initial explosion, there may have been secondary explosions as well that were detonated in the building by these terrorists. There was a secondary explosion, probably a device either planted before or on the aircraft that did not explode until an hour later. I heard a second explosion and another rumble and more smoke and more dust. I ran inside the buildings, the chandelier shook, and again, black smoke filled the air. Within another five minutes, we were covered again with more silt and more dust and then a fire marshal came in and said we had to leave because if there was a third explosion this building might not last eyewitnesses also reported that explosions had taken place in lower levels of both the north and south tower they were having coffee in the world trade center when the first plane struck and all of a sudden it sounded like i don't know where the subway is but it sounded like a subway collision a bomb and it, it, it was just pounding, boom, 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 boom. and I, I literally thought the subway had exploded. And the ladies that are with me were in the World Trade Center on the on, in the first building and escaped through the lobby where they report that they believe there was a bomb in the lobby. Just get out of the tunnel, man. In the blue. The subway tunnel? Yeah. Heard, yes, I was right there. I was in the I was down in the basement. Came down. All of a sudden, the elevator blew up smoke. I dragged the guy out, his skin was hanging off, and I dragged him out and I helped him out of the, out of, to the ambulance. And when I got up to the concourse level, it was just like, 
you know, like gunfire and then, and then just three big explosions. And even the turnstile was burnt and was sticking up and they just told us to run. I heard the first um, explosion and the elevator blew up. And as we were coming out, we passed the lobby. There was no lobby. So I believe the, the bomb hit the lobby first and a couple of seconds in the first plane hit. Firefighter John Schroeder arrived in the lobby of the North Tower shortly after the first plane struck. So we're standing there in the lobby, we're getting all together. All of a sudden, we hear... I look down to my right, and the elevator's exploded, something out of like a Bruce Willis Die Hard movie. People just come running out of the, lo out of the elevators, on fire, fireball. I mean, it was like, what is going on here? This something's up here. I mean, the plane's up there, now there's fire down here. Uh, people will run around all on fire. This is crazy. So we were heading up to the 24th floor of the stairwell, and all of a sudden we heard, Mayday, Mayday, second plane, second plane. Swift. We're looking at each other like, come on, second plane. There's no way there's a second plane. Within seconds, our building got rocked. <laughs> we got bounced around in the stairwell like pinballs, man. And we just said, you know what? Time to go. We got down to the lobby, and everything was blown out, exploded. Everything was... And we were the only ones in the lobby now. We're going, wait a second here. Where is everybody? Because the building was coming down the outside. They moved to the command post to World Trade Center, too. So now we're like, we're, 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 no, we didn't get a... We didn't get no... Where, where is everybody? We, we were in the lobby. All oh, it looks like it, everything was exploded. Everything was gone. We're like, what is going on here? We didn't know. We were like, this is crazy. But for the ele for the every window in the lobby to be exploded, I mean, them windows were like as thick as forget it. There were two, three inch glasses, you know, come on. They exploded out of the lobby, you know, something, it wasn't, it wasn't from the jet fuel. No way. The elevators exploded. They were down from the lobby. The lobby was over here. It, it, that should never have happened. Something would happen there, and that wasn't, that wasn't... <clears throat> We came down, it, was, it looked like a bomb went off in the lobby. There was no fire, it just looked like a bomb went off. So, how was the largest and most puzzling architectural failure in history treated? The steel from the World Trade Center was mostly shipped overseas, eliminating any possibility of independent investigations. New York City's Department of Design and Construction contracted four companies for debris removal. Each was assigned a specific zone and controlled and monitored by a three-person team. The operation was so controlled that in November, each dump truck used for removal of debris was fitted with a GPS locator. One driver took an extended lunch break and was dismissed from the job. By April 2002, over 185,000 tons of debris had been removed from Ground Zero. FEMA's Building Performance Assessment Team was not even granted access to Ground Zero. They were granted a tour of the site in early October, but were forbidden from collecting samples or examining blueprints. Out of hundreds of thousands of pieces of steel, 150 were preserved at Fresh Kills Landfill from where FEMA conducted its investigation. When the Twin Towers came down, they released over 500 tons of pulverized asbestos into Lower Manhattan, along with lead, barium, mercury, chromium, copper, and several other toxic chemicals. 425,000 cubic yards of concrete is pulverized. 600,000 square feet of glass is turned into dust. During the World Trade Center's construction, Spray-on fireproofing comprised of concrete and asbestos was placed on the core columns. When asbestos was outlawed in 1971, they ceased this procedure at the 64th floor of the South Tower. The Port Authority eventually realized that the asbestos presented a problem and demolition was not an option. In 1989, the Port Authority estimated the removal of asbestos from both the World Trade Center and LaGuardia Airport would have cost up to $1 billion. By 2001, the cost for the World Trade Center buildings alone would have met or exceeded $1 billion. This money would sadly not be needed. Although it was clear that the air was not safe to breathe, the public was urged to return to Lower Manhattan. Wall Street opened back up on September 17th, and children were allowed to go back to school. 
firefighters, police, and rescue workers were allowed to toil in lethal conditions using paper masks from Home Depot while government officials walked around in hazmat suits. My name is John Field. Um, I was hurt at Ground Zero during the uh, cleanup. Wow, you know, I was only there for five days before I was horribly injured, and I mean horribly injured. Leading up to that day, every day I was there, I uh, complained that it was an unsafe workplace. Someone's going to get hurt. It just happened to be me. But uh, I, let him, I, I let everybody know that someone would get hurt. I was there for five and a half days. Nobody told me to wear a mask once. Nobody gave a shit when that piece of steel altered my life. But like the thousands that are suffering and sick, I didn't roll over and play dead. And I know human life takes a backseat to the almighty dollar, and that's what makes this country roll and run is the almighty dollar. But you guys somewhere lost somewhere along the line lost your, uh, your credibility with me. The Environmental Protection Agency, under direct orders from the White House, told New Yorkers that the air was safe to breathe. The administrator at the time, Christine Whitman, issued an internal memo on September 12th, declaring that all statements to the media should be cleared through the National Security Council before they are released. So what happened? The White House changed EPA press releases to add reassuring statements and delete cautionary ones. September 13th, the EPA draft release, never released to the public, says EPA testing terrorized sites for environmental hazards. The White House changes that to EPA reassures public about environmental hazards. September 16th, the EPA draft says recent samples of dust on Water Street show higher levels of asbestos. The White House version? New samples confirm ambient air quality meets OSHA standards and is not a cause for public concern. And the White House leaves out entirely this warning, that air samples raise concerns for cleanup workers and office workers near Water Street. Why all these changes? We were told that a desire to reopen Wall Street and national security concerns were the reasons for changing the press releases. Christy Todd Whitman should be in jail for manslaughter. Christy, go to jail. Do not piss. Go. Just go to jail. Lock yourself up. Um, when I said that, everybody said, don't you think that's a little harsh? And I said, no. Six months later, every politician was saying it. Everybody was saying it like it was like saying hi. I pat myself on the back for having the nerve to, and the audacity to say that. She took orders from Condoleezza Rice, who took orders from the White House. They knew the air was bad. They lied. You should go to jail for manslaughter. For every time somebody dies, James Sedroga, Don Jones, Tim Keller, my close personal friend who I had to go to his funeral, Officer Borgia, and the many more that have died. I take this personally now. I take it real personal. You got a, an ex-mayor running for president who claims he helped us. Standing on a pile with a bullhorn, Mr. President and Mr. Giuliani, does not constitute helping anybody at all. The EPA's public release assured people that there was no significant level of asbestos in the air and that instead of evacuating, they could clean their homes with a wet rag. More people will die post 9-11 from these illnesses than died on the day itself. By 2006, 70% of the 40,000 Ground Zero workers had developed respiratory problems, hundreds of them had developed cancer, and over 80 had died. To make matters worse, a large majority of the victims from the World Trade Center were denied a decent burial and treated like garbage. A pile of approximately 500,000 tons of ash located at Fresh Kills Landfill contains 1,148 victims that have yet to be identified. Mayor Bloomberg has repeatedly denied family members' requests, replying, I've only visited my father's grave once. On top of all of this, Human remains were discovered up to 400 feet away from the South Tower, on the roof of the Deutsche Bank building. 300 bone fragments were discovered between April 7th and 14th, 2006, and more are expected to be found. Is all of the above possible with a gravity-driven global collapse? Were the Twin Towers brought down as a result of the airplanes that struck them and the fires that followed, or were they brought down in a controlled demolition?
same right, time. Right, some new information coming in. Report from Associated Press of a large plane crashing in western Pennsylvania. This is according to officials at the Somerset County Airport. A large plane crashing in western Pennsylvania. We have that plane crashed. I'm sorry, go ahead, Skip. Say it again. Uh, repeat, please, Skip. I'm, I'm saying somebody may have made that horrible decision to go ahead and take the plane down. Ten o three a.m., Shanksville, Pennsylvania. United Airlines Flight ninety three allegedly plows into an abandoned strip mine at five hundred eighty miles per hour. Twenty minutes flying time from Washington D.C. Originally, the official story is that passengers on board the plane overthrew the hijackers and sacrificed themselves to prevent further casualties. The 9-11 Commission will later conclude that hijacker Ziad Jarrah, anticipating a cockpit overthrow, crashes the plane into the ground. Debris from Flight 93 was found considerable distances from the crash site. The debris here is spread over a three to four mile radius, which has now been completely sealed off and is being treated, according to the FBI, as a crime scene. This is one of those cases where the pictures really do tell the story that sort of the most horrifying aspect of this particular crash scene is how little debris is visible. That's really all you see is a large crater in the ground and, and just tiny, tiny bits of debris. There has been at least one report that the uh, investigators out there, and there are hundreds of them, as I said tonight, um, have found nothing larger than a phone book. Well, Darren, in the last hour or so, the FBI and the state police here have confirmed that they have cordoned off a second area about six to eight miles away from the crater here where this plane went down. This is apparently another debris site, which raises a number of questions. Why would debris from the plane, and they identified it specifically as being from this plane, why would debris be located six miles away? Could it have blown that far away? Seems highly unlikely. Almost all the debris found at this site is within 100 yards, 200 yards away. So it raises some questions. We don't want to over speculate, of course. It seems to me from covering a number of plane crashes on on the scene that if nothing else, you can say this is not typical for a plane crash to be spread across an area this large. It certainly doesn't make sense because most of the, the debris has been found in a very compact area within 100 yards, 200 yards, maybe a little beyond that. And then all of a sudden they're telling us six miles away, they have another concentration of debris. They say it's very small pieces. Most of these are very small pieces. Most of the pieces here are no bigger than the size of a briefcase, they say. Mm -hmm. And the pieces six miles away may be even smaller than that. Did they find a plane in Shanksville? Within the last hour. I want to get qu uh, quickly to Chris Kanicki. He was back there just a couple of minutes ago. And Chris, I've seen the pictures. It looks like there's nothing there except for a hole in the ground. Uh, basically, that's right. The only thing you could see from where we were uh, was a big gouge in the earth and some broken trees. From where we could see, there wasn't much left. Any large pieces of debris at all? No, there was nothing, nothing that you could distinguish that a plane had crashed there. Smoke, fire? Nothing. It was absolutely quiet. It was uh, actually very quiet. Um, nothing going on down there. No smoke, no fire. Just a couple of people walking around. They look like part of the NTSB crew walking around looking at the pieces. How big would you say that hole was? Uh, from my estimates, I would guess it was probably about 20 to 15 feet uh, long and a, probably about 10 feet long or 10 feet wide. What could you see on the ground, if anything, other than dirt and ash? And you couldn't see anything. You could just see dirt, ash, and people walking around, broken trees. From the Somerset County corner to the mayor of Shanksville, almost every eyewitness would remark how little of the plane and its passengers remained. But when I got there, you know, I wondered to myself, where is it? You know, there was just, the plane was just totally disintegrated. The only thing we didn't see were people. Nothing uh, to indicate that, uh, that there was even anybody on the plane. I remember asking a state trooper that was there to be sure, is that where the plane went down? It was so hard to tell because there was nothing around. The Pennsylvania state website puts it best. It is difficult to believe that a 757 plunged into the ground with such force that the plane literally disintegrated and created a still smoldering crater. Is there any historical precedent 
for a commercial airliner disintegrating upon impact. The emergency services realize their task is hopeless. Jod Heavey and his team confront the horror of the scene. The twisted wreckage of 191 lies scattered for hundreds of meters. Debris had smashed into the trailer park, destroying five homes. In 1988, Pan Am 103 exploded in mid-air over the town of Lockerbie in Scotland, killing 270 people. Terrorists checked a bag containing a bomb into the hold, but didn't board the plane. The sea below them is on fire. saying that uh, the pilot was able to dump fuel over Jamaica Bay. It immediately veered over to the right and uh, it came nose down only a block away from where I was working. And the room just exploded. My daughter got blown through the patio doors. My wife got blown into the living room and I got blown out the patio doors behind my daughter. Several blocks away from the primary crash scene, the aircraft may have been rocked by vibrations severe enough to knock the engines off the wings. Jim, let me uh, just tell our audience what you're looking at. These are from Jamaica Bay. This is clearly a part of the plane. Can yes, that would be the uh, horizontal stabilizer, the vertical tail fin on the back of the airplane. In 2006, during the trial of Zacharias Massawi, the FBI managed to provide a multitude of evidence that appears to have survived a catastrophic crash in near pristine condition. Among the exhibits were a red bandana, a Kingdom of Saudi Arabia driver's license, John Talignani's driver's license, and flight attendant C.C. Lyle's personal effects including her driver's license and Marriott hotel card. Although a 757 managed to obliterate itself upon impact, paper and fabric managed to survive without a scratch. They also released pictures of an engine and two pieces of fuselage. It is not specified where those were found. Once again, the FBI stepped in to supervise every aspect of the investigation. They repeatedly denied family members' requests to listen to the cockpit voice recorder. The FBI gave in on April 18, 2002, as long as the victim's relatives didn't talk about it. And for some reason, the last three minutes were unaccounted for. No explanation has been given. Even after Zacharias Massawi's sentencing, the actual cockpit voice recorder has yet to be released. The 9-11 Commission concludes that the military was not informed of Flight 93 until 10.07, minutes after it had crashed. We you know, heard the explosion. Actually, our power had gone off, and then we felt a tremor. We had just gotten up, and the next thing I know, uh, it sounded like a missile came across our house. I mean, they, they were going that fast. It was, it was flying, it was coming from that direction. I, I had no, I have no idea what it, what it was. Oh no, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the, the aircraft that, that crashed, no. I, it's hard for me to believe that they did not know about that aircraft until 10.07. That's difficult for me to believe. Despite the discussions about military assistance, no one from FAA headquarters requested military assistance regarding United 93, nor did any manager at FAA headquarters pass any of the information it had about United 93 to the military. A year after 9-11, military officials were telling an entirely different story, that Flight 93 was being tracked. In the Pentagon Command Center, there's a report of another hijacked plane, United Airlines Flight 93. We received a report from the FAA that Flight 93 had turned off his transponder, had turned, and was now heading towards Washington, D.C. The decision was made to try to go intercept Flight 93. The rules have changed. We could do something about it now. 
Colonel Bob Marr is in command at the Northeast Air Defense Sector base in Rome, New York. The words that I remember as clear as day was, we will take lives in the air to preserve lives on the ground. Marr orders his air controllers tell the pilots to intercept Flight 93. United Airlines Flight 93 will not be allowed to reach Washington, D.C. The closure time came and went, and nothing had happened. So you can imagine uh, everything was very tense. Flight 93 is about 175 miles north and west of Washington, flying over Somerset County, Pennsylvania. Up above, a fighter jet streaks by. It was about, you know, 10.03 that the fighters reported that Flight 93 had crashed. Eventually, of course, we never fired on any aircraft. When you heard the plane was down without a shot being fired at it, do you remember what you said? We just witnessed an act of heroism. Was Flight 93 downed by hijackers in an open field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania? Or is the truth being withheld from the public? I want to tell you that we are getting word from New York right now that another building has collapsed. I understand that this is a 47-story building. It's, it's Building 7 of the World Trade Center, we understand, has collapsed in New York. Mm. And there you saw a video of it. Uh, no, whether, uh, we, don't, we, we don't even know whether this was uh, something that was uh, engineered for safety reasons or it just happened. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. In 1984, construction began on World Trade Center Building 7, a 47-story office building, 570 feet tall, and 300 feet away from the North Tower. It opened to the public in 1987 and housed offices for Department of Defense, Securities and Exchange Commission, and the Internal Revenue Service. Building 7 was considered the Central Intelligence Agency's largest station outside of Washington, D.C., and was also the Secret Service's biggest field office. Numerous cases would be closed due to its destruction. On June 8, 1999, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani's Office of Emergency Management Command Center on the 23rd floor is opened. The command center on the 23rd floor is bulletproof and bomb resistant, with its own air supply and generators. It's linked to city airports, the Coast Guard, and the Pentagon. Computers will soon have detailed blueprints of every major building in New York City, as well as evacuation routes. Hurricanes and heat waves would be handled here, as well as terrorist attacks. Though New York officials say their facility is not impenetrable, they're confident it could handle even the worst crisis imaginable. Deborah Fayerick for CNN, New York. The 50,000 square foot center has reinforced, bulletproof, and bomb resistant walls its own air supply and water tank, beds and showers, and three backup generators. It has countless monitors which oversee police and fire department responses, and it is staffed around the clock. Hours before the first plane would strike the World Trade Center, Building 7's alarm system would be placed on test status at 6.47 a.m. for a scheduled period of eight hours. This normally occurs during maintenance, and any fire alarms from the building are disregarded. After the second plane strikes the South Tower, the building's power is shut off and its tenants are evacuated. The major fires in World Trade Center 7 were as follows. On the east face, between floors 11 and 12. On the north face, on floors 7 and 12. On the west face, between floors 29 and 30. Smoke obscures the entire south face of the building. By 3 p.m., Chief Daniel Nigro of the FDNY had set up a collapse zone around Building 7. After 4 p.m., news outlets began reporting that the building had collapsed. 
We are getting information now that one of the other buildings, Building 7 in the World Trade Center complex, is on fire and has either collapsed or is collapsing. We've got some news just coming in, actually, that the Salomon Brothers building in New York, right in the, uh, the heart of Manhattan, has also collapsed. Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. You might have heard a few moments ago, I was talking about the Salomon Brothers building collapsing. And indeed it has. Apparently that's only a few hundred yards away from where the World Trade Center towers were. And it seems that this was not a result of a new attack. It was because the uh, building had been weakened uh, during uh, this morning's attacks. We'll probably find out more now about that from our correspondent, Jane Stanley. Presumably there were very few people in the Salomon building when it collapsed. I mean, th there were, I suppose, fears of possible further collapses around the area. That's what you would hope because this whole downtown area behind me has been completely sealed off and evacuated apart from the emergency workers. That was done by the mayor, Rudy Giuliani. Jane, I think many of us, when we heard the news, perhaps on the radio earlier today, were uh, completely flabbergasted by it and, and just couldn't un comprehend it. I mean, it, was, it almost sounded too far-fetched. Um, I was wondering what it's felt like for you being in Manhattan. Well, unfortunately, I think we've lost the line with uh, Jane Stanley in Manhattan. Perhaps we can rejoin her and follow that up later. Where did CNN and BBC get their information, especially considering the building was still standing directly behind their reporters? The collapse of the building at 5.20 p.m. would cause speculation as to how it fell. The collapse of the main structure takes place in approximately 6.5 seconds. And the building falls symmetrically into its own footprint, barely damaging the surrounding structures. It will create a pyroclastic cloud that mushrooms down surrounding streets. Initially, it is assumed that the building's diesel tank may have been responsible for the collapse. The Federal Emergency Management Agency's report in 2002 will state that the specifics of the fires in WTC-7 and how they caused the building to collapse remain unknown at this time. FEMA does analyze the collapse of Building 7, but then they say our best hypothesis has only a low probability of occurrence this needs further investigation. And I certainly agree with them on that. Then NIST has handed the ball. It's kind of a hot potato. Okay, NIST, you uh, explain the collapse of uh, World Trade Center 7, this rapid straight down collapse of this 47-story uh, skyscraper. Sadly, by this time, virtually all structural steel from Ground Zero had been recycled. And no steel was recovered from Building 7 for investigation. As of this date, NIST is still working on their final report. Well, NIST decoupled the study of the collapse of Building 7 from the analysis of the collapse of the towers. So now it's sitting over here. The report on the collapse of Building 7 from NIST is long overdue. Uh, <clears throat> it's, we're, we're still waiting for it, uh, hoping they have an explanation. We are looking at it. Um, there's actually a very good write-up uh, recently uh, from controlled demolition experts, which you probably ought to read. Um, we haven't finished the investigation yet, so I'm not at, at liberty to, to talk about any intermediate findings. The collapse is assumed to be caused by a combination of fire and structural damage. Did any other surrounding buildings suffer a complete collapse at near freefall speed? Building 3, a 22-story building directly below the Twin Towers, was split in half by the South Tower's collapse. Although the building was severely crushed by falling debris, the structure remained standing. Building 4, a 9-story building east of the South Tower, was almost completely destroyed. The remaining structure did not collapse. Building 5, a 9-story building east of the North Tower, suffered from severe fires and structural damage. Building 6, an 8-story building between the North Tower and Building 7, suffered a giant gouge in its roof and severe fires. Neither Building 5 or 6 suffered global collapse.
Neither did the Deutsche Bank building, which stands to this day and is currently being demolished beam by beam. Neither did the Millennium Hotel across the street. Building 7 burns over a number of floors and suffers structural damage to its south face before collapsing completely to the ground. Did anything occur inside the building that might cause a collapse? We started walking down the stairs, we made it to the eighth floor. Big explosion. Blew us back into the eighth floor. And I turned to Hesh, I, I said, this is it, we're dead. We're, we're not gonna make it out of here. And we have Frank Uciardo back on the phone with okay. us, Brenda, with uh, some New York City officials. Frank, go ahead. That's right, I'm standing here right now, just off Broadway by City Hall with Michael Hess, who is the city's corporation counsel. Mr. Hess, you were trapped in, I believe, Seven World Trade Center. Go ahead, sir. Yes, I was. I was up in the emergency management center on the 23rd floor, and when all the power went out in the building, uh, another gentleman and I walked down to the 8th floor where there was an explosion, and we've been trapped on the 8th floor with smoke, thick smoke, all around us for about an hour and a half. But the New York Fire Department, as terrific as they are, just came and got us out. Their experience is mentioned by NIST's interim report on Building 7. However, the authors claim it is the collapse of the North Tower. The glass on the ground floor was not even blown out. Would debris and smoke rushing up the stairway be described as an explosion? So, we have a 47-story steel-framed skyscraper which housed various government agencies and numerous important documents, damaged less than the other World Trade Center buildings. At 5.20 p.m., all structural elements inside Building 7 simultaneously fail, and it collapses symmetrically, imploding into a pile of rubble. This building had 81 columns, 24 core and 57 perimeter, running from the basement to the roof. For the building to have collapsed the way it did, all 81 of these columns had to collapse simultaneously. Could fires on a few floors have heated up all these columns to the breaking point at the same time? Let's ask the 9-11 Commission. Governor King, may I ask another question, please? Uh, on fi at 5.20 p.m. on September 11th, World Trade Center Building Number 7, 47-story modern frame steel skyscraper that no plane hit, collapsed into a neat little pile onto itself and exhibiting all the characteristics of controlled demolition. FEMA, in their investigation, I didn't say that. They said the fire must have knocked it down, but they couldn't figure out how. Uh, video evidence shows what appears to be explosive squids going up the side of the building from south to north or from bottom to top as the building collapsed. Uh, there was molten metal found in the basement of that building at temperatures that exceeded anything normal fire could cause. Uh, with all the confusion about what happened to Building 7, why is there not a word about the collapse of that building in the 911 Commission report? We didn't see any, any evidence of the kind of thing you're talking about. We thought that was one of the, part of the tragedy of 9-11. Uh, the there was no evidence. Later on, there was not a lot of loss of life in that building. Uh, and it was not, uh, not part of our report. Not part of the report. Thanks. Governor? Yeah. Um. So for the 9-11 Commission to totally ignore that, I think is unconscionable and shows that they did not do a thorough job. Did Building 7 collapse because of damage from the falling North Tower? Or was it also a controlled demolition? The reaction on the pictures that we let see is unbevangen. Zie je vanaf boven gaan? Nee, je gaat vanaf onder. Die gaat vanaf onder, ja. Toch? Ja. Ze hebben gewoon kolommen weggeblazen. Ze is nagesprongen. Dit, dit is... valt anders dan het World Trade Center. Vind je niet dan? Ja, je ziet dit. De onderste verdiepingen gaan eerst. Ja, en de rest zakt er gewoon in. Dus en, dit is controlled demolition. Zeker weten. Zeker weten. Er is nagesprongen. Dit is in opdracht gebeurd. Dit heeft een team gedaan van experts. Maar dit is ook op 11 september gebeurd. Dezelfde dag? Dezelfde dag. Dezelfde dag? Weet je dat zeker? Ja. Was het zeker weten de 11e? Totaal heel waar zijn. Zeven uur nadat de World Trade Center naar beneden viel. Ja? Hebben ze hard gewerkt.
in the aftermath of 9-11. Citizens and politicians alike would demand that steps be taken to ensure such attacks never happen again. In late January 2002, Senate Majority Leader Tom Daschle receives calls from both President Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney, urging him to limit the investigation to the House and Senate committees. The administration would continue to oppose the investigation until November 2002, when Congress creates the National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States to make a full and complete accounting of the circumstances surrounding the attacks. Democratic leaders concede several aspects after the White House threatens to create the commission by executive order, giving themselves considerable control. President Bush officially signs it into law November 27, 2002, and names Henry Kissinger as chairman of the 9-11 Commission. The Chicago Tribune puts it best. Kissinger is known more for keeping secrets from the American public than telling the truth. On December 13, 2002, Kissinger resigns from the 9-11 Commission, due mostly to a congressional demand that he disclose his private business clients. It would later be revealed that Kissinger was the chief advisor to the Bush administration regarding the Iraq War, a lie which has now cost more American lives than 9-11 itself. Thomas Kane and Lee Hamilton are named as chairman and vice chairman of the 9-11 Commission. By December 16, 2002, the 10 initial members of the 9-11 Commission have been appointed to the stage. And the man missing from this picture? Philip Zelikow, Executive Director. He would shape both the commission and its final report. The 9-11 Commission begins its investigation with a time frame of 18 months and a starting budget of $3 million. January 27, 2003. The 9-11 Commission holds its first hearing in Washington, D.C. Vice Chairman Lee Hamilton will claim a few days later, we're not interested in trying to assess blame. We do not consider that part of the Commission's responsibility. March 26, 2003. The Bush administration denies the Commission's request for an additional $11 million in funding. Three days later, the Commission is offered $9 million, and they accept. In April 2004, President Bush agrees to testify before the 9-11 Commission, but only if Vice President Dick Cheney joins in. Why did they insist on appearing together? The 9-11 Commission wants to ask us questions. That's why we're meeting, and I look forward to meeting with them and answering their questions. Oh, sorry, uh, President, why you're appearing together rather than separately, which was their request? Because it's a good chance for both of us to answer questions that the 9-11 Commission is uh, looking forward to asking us, and I'm looking forward to answering them. On April 29, 2004, behind closed doors, President Bush and Vice President Dick Cheney appear together before the 9-11 Commission for approximately three hours. They are not placed under oath, their testimony is not recorded, and the Commission's notes are subject to White House censorship. Mr. President, as you know, a lot of critics suggested that you wanted to appear jointly with the Vice President so that you two could keep your story straight or something. Yeah. Can you tell us what you think of the value of appearing together and how you would answer those critics? Yeah, uh, first of all, look, I mean, if we had something to hide, we wouldn't have met with them in the first place. I came away good about the session. I think they found it to be useful. Yeah, Adam. Mr. President, did, 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 yes. did, don't you think that the families deserve to have a transcript or to be able to see what <laughs> Adam, you said? Adam, you asked me that question yesterday. I got the same answer, yeah. May 19th, 2004. Rudolph Giuliani testifies before the 9-11 Commission. We will now hear from our first witness, 
The very distinguished uh, former mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani. Uh, mayor, Giuliani. mayor Giuliani, would you please rise and raise your right hand and place you under oath. And the fact that so many of them interpreted it that way kept a much calmer situation and a much better evacuation. These people, these people, Thomas Kane and Lee Hamilton will later claim in their book, Without Precedent, that they were too soft on Mayor Giuliani. One of the questions they failed to ask was who warned him that the South Tower was going to collapse. Mr. Mayor, can you hear me? I can, Peter. Are you talking about the... You, did you go immediately to the Office of Emergency Management? Uh, I, I went down to the scene and we set up uh, headquarters at 75 Barclay Street, which was right there with the police commissioner, the fire commissioner, and we were operating out of there when we were told that the World Trade Center was gonna collapse. And it did collapse before we could actually get out of the building. Who didn't warn everyone in the building? I admire that greatly. And I think that may... 50,000 people are dead. They're well because be he's a great leader. One of the reasons for health, your leadership, and uh, your cooperation with this two minutes to rebut you. Let's ask Thank you. the real God bless question. You. The 9-11 Commission would release its final report on July 22nd, 2004, and closed its doors on August 21st. So the 9-11 Commission was a cover-up. The question is what it was covering up. The charitable explanation is gross negligence, malfeasance, misfeasance, and whatever what you call it, okay? If you can't read all 571 pages of the report, in August 2006, the 9-11 Report comic book was released. It should tell you all you need to know. On the morning of September 11th, 19 Arabs boarded four commercial airliners at three different airports and crashed them into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon with zero military intervention. Or, we have been and continue to be lied to about the events of September 11th and that elements within the United States government and mainstream media continue to cover up the truth. These are the same people that lied about weapons of mass destruction. They endorsed a lie that's killed several hundred thousand innocent people overseas. Could they also endorse a lie that killed almost 3,000 innocent people in our own country? Our entire foreign and domestic policy has been based upon the events of September 11th. It has enabled the passage of Patriot Act 1 and 2. Established the Department of Homeland Security. Facilitated the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. And used to pass the Military Commissions Act, which officially ended habeas corpus. Habeas corpus uh, in Latin means you have the body. It's a provision in the law where no one can just scoop up someone, put them in a black hole and keep them there without that person having the right to appeal to a court and say, you have the body, now what do you charge this person with and what redress does he or she have? As well as domestic surveillance, all in the name of fighting terrorism. And who ends up paying for all this? You do. Your children do. When President Bush entered office, he inherited a $284 billion surplus. His administration is now responsible for four out of the top five deficits in history. The fifth place belongs to his father. As of November 2nd, 2005, the Bush administration had borrowed more from foreign nations than all previous administrations combined. From 1776 to 2000, 42 presidents 
borrowed a total of $1.01 trillion from foreign governments and institutions. From 2001 to 2005, the Bush administration alone borrowed $1.05 trillion. Where does this money go? The government designed by the people, for the people, has turned its back on us. Or have we turned our backs on it? They spy on us. They torture and imprison innocent civilians. Ask yourself, what's happening? Where are we headed? And would we be here today without 9-11? Will somebody please tell us who's in charge? We need order. We can't stand this new world slaughter. It reeks of oil seats and bloody handshakes. U.S. interests and war profiteers. Our life is here in the belly of the beast. Where things kill the innocent and pray for peace. Slaughter for the chief commander. So we're at the White House steps. The man in answers, but they don't got none. We've got few choices. Protest or pick up shotguns. We're so stressed, we know the watcher might arrest us. So with the Keep for talking And we ain't made no death threats Feds upset So our phones infested Think John Lennon Resurrected Speaking truth to power Till we have no breath left We say no more We're gonna fight back We want the truth out We want our rights back Loose change Changes lose no stopping now Changes lose no stopping now We say no more We're gonna fight back We want the truth out We want our rights back Loose change Changes lose no stopping now Changes looks no stopping now We keep our mouths and minds open Hoping we can change the world Media blacked out Still we don't act out We've been civilized despite the killing You call yourselves patriots Label us villains My comrades and nomads Get up all free thinkers Rich kids, poor kids Lawyers and teachers Dads, moms, past war veterans Peddling the truth We ain't settling The proof is clear as water Yeah, you got a lot of hate Try and charm us with a plot of hate What are you, an asshole? Your war's illegal Your cause is evil You burn people as red nuts with a sequel, you're a sicko psycho. We've seen the proof. You can't intimidate the world from delivering truth. We're bigger than you. 40 million plus. Your guns ain't big enough to make us hush. We say no more. We're gonna fight back. We want the truth out. We want our rights back. Loose change. Changes lose no stopping now. Changes lose no stopping now. We say no more. We're gonna fight back. We want the truth out. We want our rights back. Loose change. Changes lose no stopping now. Changes lose no stopping now We do this for the lives lost, devoured by evil For the sake of the memory of innocent people Engulfed by the gluttony of hooligans Who leave the world in ruins Men here to do a sin But there's just a few of them And more of us We warriors On the quest for justice We crush the lies Trust only the facts Just open your eyes Who really attack? My feelings exactly Facts be lacking on the hijacking Synchronized war against facilitated plane crashes And they wonder why we keep asking questions Am I listening? Liberty, like it's a profession, so here we are, the infantry We the people simply need to start a revolution of our minds And eventually the crime of the century will finally be solved Until then, we stand tall and say no more We're gonna fight back, we want the truth out We want our rights back, loose change Changes lose, no stopping now Changes lose, no stopping now We say no more, we're gonna fight back We want the truth out, we want our rights back Loose change Changes lose, no stopping now Changes looks no stopping now